and today we have our very own chief resident, um, Dr. Ramsey Larson, here to present. Um, she received her uh, undergraduate degree in psychology from the University of Puget Sound. Um, she went on to receive her medical degree from the University of Washington School of Medicine um, and then came here to UW. Um, during her time here, she has been extensively involved in quality improvement work as well as uh, a lot of great work with EPIC improvement projects. Um, and so I'm very excited to have her here to present to us this morning. All right, thanks Dr. Bizzuto. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So my grand round topic is waste within the healthcare system, specifically how your actions impact patients, providers, and the planet. I had a really hard time actually picking a grand, grand rounds topic. I talked to Stephanie Peace probably for like hours and hours and she's probably sick of hearing from me. And then finally, what got me to this topic was Antonio Romo, one of our recent graduates, who I feel like is the king of grand round ideas, the king of QI changes. And so we were talking one night and we ultimately came up with this topic. It specifically resonated with me as I was uh, just spent the last seven weeks on GYN surgery. And so I was in the OR. And as a person who grew up recycling every single little thing ever, it just drove me absolutely crazy. And the just throw stuff away, we open things we don't use. And so I wanted to look into that more specifically. So that is what this Grand Rounds is about today. So um, let's see, there we go. So objective specifically is to assess trends in healthcare spending and utilization in the US and throughout the world to identify areas of overspending and waste within the U.S. healthcare system, and to discuss specific areas to target and strategies to decrease our own spending and waste as members of the healthcare team. I have no idea. We can't see your slide. Hey, Ramsey, we can't see your slides. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. What? I think you're so, still in the web browser. If oh, you go that's why. Classic. Yeah. So, well, yeah, just take, take a minute want. to try and pull them up and... I'll just tell everybody um, that you're a highly recruited resident and we're all so proud of you. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Hartenbach. Okay, let's try this again. Take two. Also, I used to think that giving WebEx presentations wasn't challenging and then now that I'm doing one, it's actually a lot harder than just logging onto a WebEx. So bear with me, everyone. Can you see them now? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I have no financial disclosures, obviously, um, but also you'll note that I am using a lot of brand names and devices during this talk. Um, so sorry, and I'm not getting paid by anybody. So $3.6 trillion. That's a lot of zeros. That's the total that's spent on national health expenditures in the United States in 2018. 75% of this came from health insurance companies, which the large part of that in the US is from private healthcare insurance companies, but obviously that also includes Medicare and Medicaid. About 10% of this comes out of out-of-pocket costs from patients. Where all this obviously is to a whole bunch of different places, but 33% of it or a third and the largest portion of that goes to hospital care. So that's basically what I'm going to focus on today. From here on out, just so you know, I will refer to national health expenditures as healthcare spending. In terms of the history of healthcare spending in the United States, you can see on this graph that our spending has increased dramatically since 1970 on the left and 2018 on the right. In 1970, our country spent $74.5 billion on healthcare, which has increased to that $3.6 trillion that I mentioned to you. Specifically, how we can compare that to other countries is looking at it as a percentage of our GDP or our gross domestic product. In the United States, our GDP, we used to spend 6.9% of our GDP on healthcare, and now we're spending 17.7% of our GDP on healthcare. How we compare to other countries, obviously, would be the interesting thing to know, and I think it's no surprise to you guys that the U.S. fares rather poorly when it comes to stacking up, up against other countries. Specifically, this graph um, shows spending as a percentage of GDP by country. 
The United States is that bolded dark kind of brown line on the top of the graph there. And uh, that shows that we in the United States spend that 17.7% of our GDP on health care. Um, just so you know, that roughly comes out to about $11,000 per person. In comparison to other countries, what this graph specifically shows is um, factors or the percent of GDP from Australia, Canada, Denmark, France, Germany, Japan, the Netherlands, Sweden, Switzerland, and the UK, which were specifically chosen in an article that I was looking at because they're amongst the highest income countries in the world. They have a relatively high healthcare spending and they have comparable populations and burden of disease to the United States. So in terms of actually comparing what we're doing to what they're doing, it's some of the best comparison that we can do. The 12 number there is associated with Switzerland. So they're second to the US in terms of the percent of GDP that they spend on healthcare. And then the 11.5% is the average of the rest of everybody, not including the United States because we're so far above, but the rest of all those countries that I mentioned in terms of the percent of their GDP that they spend on healthcare. So you're probably wondering why is the United States healthcare so darn expensive? There's a lot of theories for why we have increased spending in the United States. Some of these are basically universally accepted. Some are kind of newer theories and some are kind of, it depends who you talk to in terms of if people think it contributes that much or not. So we'll go through some of them. In general, administrative costs are super high within our healthcare system. Because the US healthcare system is so complex, we have private insurance, care, we have Medicaid, we have different hospitals regulating things. What St. Mary's does and bills for things is different than what we at Meritor might do. What we at Meritor do might be different from what UW does. And so specifically that in and of itself creates extremely high administrative costs. In places like the UK and Sweden and Denmark, where they have a national health care system, those administrative costs are much less. In general, it's thought that about 8% of our budget goes to administrative costs. And in other countries that have national health care programs, it's around 1% to 2 to potentially up to 3%. Another thought is that physician salaries are super high in the United States. Primary care doctors on average earn about $218,000 a year in the US. In Sweden, they get about $86,000 a year. In Germany, for another example, they get about $154,000 a year. For specialists, um, specialists in the US get about $316,000 a year, whereas in Sweden, it's about $98,000. And then in Australia, he randomly said was $202,000. So this is obviously kind of a hot topic issue, especially as a resident, someone with medical student loans. Um, I'm not at all saying that we should all get paid less. I think in the US it's very complex in the sense that we have high malpractice insurance. We pay a lot for our education that, not, that isn't necessarily um, a factor in education in other areas. Um, but this is definitely a factor that there's a big difference between what we're getting paid and what other people are getting paid. Test procedures and pharmaceutical costs are high and not well regulated. So in general, to give you a couple of CT scans in the US cost about $896. In Canada, they cost $97. Um, in terms of surgeries, I'll talk more specifically about our surgeries later. But something that was mentioned in an article in JAMA was that coronary artery, artery bypass grafts cost $75,000 in the US. And in the Netherlands, which is the cheapest, they cost $15,000. The US also has incredibly high pharmaceutical costs, which we see in the news all the time. Um, obviously, we've seen it for insulin. Something that this article that I keep referencing was talking about was something like Advair, which is a medication for asthma. Um, we in the U.S. or people here in the U.S. spend approximately $155 a month on this, whereas it costs half as much. It costs $75 a month in a place like or a place like Canada. Another theory is that hospitals and insurance companies are consolidated. Obviously, big groups are buying hospitals. They're kind of taking over, like the Midwest or where I'm working next year is something that's kind of slowly buying up hospitals and physician groups in Washington. Um, and as hospitals and insurance companies keep getting bigger and bigger, they are able to kind of set prices for the things that people are using more so than if it's regulated at a national level. Fewer patients in the US are insured. The thought is that we basically are providing care, <laughs> excuse me, that we are paying for care for um, 
not insured. In the United States, about 90% of people are insured. And in those other high income countries that I've previously talked about, 99 to 100% of people are insured. There's also the theory that the US practices defensive medicine, especially in the era of litigation. We have all these tests at our disposal and we can use all these tests and it can help support what we're doing and help um, provide again, support in kind of a court of law about like, why did you make this decision? And, you know, hey, I got this test and that imaging and whatnot, and that helped guide me in this direction. The last is that the US uses a fee for service system, which is kind of backwards when you think about it. So basically if someone comes in here um, let's talk about for a heart attack again. The labs that we order, the imaging that we order, the hospital say that they have is all billed separately. Whereas in, in other countries, if you come in for MI or for a heart attack, it's like this um, global fee basically that you're paying. Um, the thought now is that utilization, so kind of these last two things specifically might not be as big of a contributor um to increase health care spending within the u.s and specifically the things that now are kind of under everybody's watch is administrative costs and then the test procedures and pharmaceutical costs so obviously if we are spending all this extra money on health care what you want to know is are we getting something out of it quality of health care in the united states a lot better than those other high income countries that we are comparing ourselves to. And as I'm sure you guys can imagine, the answer is no. So quantity, the amount that we're spending on healthcare does not at all come out to quality. Specifically in the United States, those other uh, countries that I keep talking about, we have the shortest life expectancy. We have the highest infant mortality rate. We have the highest neonatal mortality rate. We have the highest maternal mortality rate. And we also have the highest obesity which as we all know, contributes to many other healthcare problems that also then in and of itself creates more expense and a bigger issue. For those visual people here, which when you look at this, you think, whoa, Ramsey, this is a crazy slide, which it kind of is, but this is exactly what I was saying, but visually. Look at all the yellow on here. This is the United States and how we're faring against all of those other countries. So again, you can see obesity on the top, life expectancy in the middle, and then maternal infant health on the bottom. Life expectancy is on the right. We are the lowest there in all areas. And then in, in terms of uh, maternal mortality, we are the highest and everyone else is much farther behind. Specifically looking at the US, we have 26.4 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. The next is in the UK and that's 9.2 per 100,000 live births. So clearly what we're doing is not working. So what I want to do video, um, it's going to be a couple, it's about two minutes. It was something that was published in JAMA in 2019. Um, so let me know if you guys, can you see the screen thus far? I can't hear it. And a new special communication published in JAMA estimates that 25% of that spending is waste. As we try to build quality healthcare in the U.S., we're going to have to reckon with that waste. To me, the word quality refers to the match between the work you do and the, the, the products and services you make and the need you're trying to meet. That's Don Berwick, former administrator for Medicare and Medicaid. If you meet the need, that's quality. If you fail to meet the need, that's not quality. If that's the definition of quality, then waste is the opposite of quality. It's doing stuff that doesn't help. Will Schrenk, one of the authors of the new study, joined JAMA's editor-in-chief, Howard Bachner, to discuss this on a recent podcast. So, let's give people the totals. Ding, 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 or whatever the sound is for Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> the actual amount, somewhere between $760 and $935 billion a year. That's the total estimated waste. So, let's break down how the money is being wasted. The authors estimated waste in six categories, starting with an obvious one, fraud and abuse. Here's the price tag. Another obvious one, pricing failure, or high prices that are way out of proportion to the value of services and products. But that's only the second largest category. The largest category is administrative complexity, the costs of infrastructure for billing, coding, documentation, and payment. There's waste in clinical practice too. That's these three categories. 
Things like medical errors, overtesting, lack of adoption of preventive care, unnecessary ED visits, and inefficient use of high cost clinicians and hospitals are also waste. Collectively, these three categories account for as much as 345 billion. Right about now, you might be thinking something should be done. We didn't want to sort of have tell a helpless story about how much we waste. Not so that was kind of my reaction is like, whoa, something needs to be done. Um, tell me when I'm back on my own screen. Am I back to sharing mode? Not yet. Hold on. Okay, cool. Um, so I'll just keep talking kind of while you're switching me back and we'll see. Okay, hopefully, And then now you can share. Yep. Oh, perfect. Okay. So obviously that is a ton of money that we're wasting. And we as healthcare providers, I think potentially feel like just a small little piece of this large system. Indeed, we can't necessarily say how much we're spending on administrative costs in our healthcare system. We can't necessarily say, you know, how this is gonna cost this much for a hospital to buy. But what we as providers can actually really become more cognizant of and can make a difference is what we're using and specifically what we are wasting. And a lot of what I'm gonna focus on for the rest of this talk is what we in OBGYN are doing or what we're not doing and what we're wasting and what that has, how that's impacting our patients and the world. You um, might wanna put, you, um, put your presentation back up because I couldn't put it back up for you. You just have to go to share and put it back up. I know, it just, okay. Um, can you see it? This is ridiculous. Sorry, you guys. Right. I promise that I'm not incompetent. Hey, Ramsey, <clears throat> it'll be easier if you just share your screen instead of sharing an individual application. Okay. From here on out, I'm just going to be in this, though, so I think it should be just fine. Thanks, Dr. Brown. Can you guys? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Um. So what I'm going to focus on now specifically is within OBGYN, and first we're going to talk about our costs to our patients. So in terms of talking about costs to patients, what we first need to talk about is billing, which is something that I think in medical education we really don't learn anything about. So what I did is I called one of the Meritor billing people, and she basically walked me through like step by step broken down way like this is what happens. So this might be very basic for some people, but for me, it was like a very helpful overview of what we do in terms of billing for our patients. So before surgery, a patient who's getting a surgery, for example, and we're just gonna focus on this right now, receives an estimate of the cost of their surgery. That estimate comes from a combination of hospital and OR fees, a combination of specific surgical fees. So if you're getting like a DNC versus if you're getting a hysterectomy, um, and then physician fees as well, which is usually more of a set cost. Um, after surgery, the patient receives an updated bill of the true cost of surgery. And then after that, the insurance company will reimburse the hospital at a certain percentage of this bill. We think about reimbursement in something like courts usually reimburses like 65% of what the hospital people, whereas things like Medicare and Medicaid reimburse at a much lower percentage. Um, and then depending on individuals' deductibles, where they're at with that and what their insurance plan is, patients will pay a certain percent of what the insurance company ultimately says, hey, I'll pay for that. And so that's where that out of cost comes from. So looking at um, an example, this is obviously not accurate numbers at all, but we'll get to that. Um, before surgery estimate is about, let's say $1,200. After surgery, for, or maybe it's a little less time that they're in the OR, their actual surgical cost comes out to $1,000. The insurance company, so let's say Quartz, reimburses the hospital at 65%. So they say, hey, Meritor, I'm going to pay you $650. And then the patient has to ultimately cover a portion of this cost. So it totally depends, again, on what their insurance is and how much of their deductible they paid and whatnot. But let's say they, the patient out-of-pocket cost comes to about $100 in this case. So you can kind of see like where we're losing money and also what the patient is paying in regards to the entire procedure and the entire bill. So speaking specifically about obstetric and obstetric care in the U.S., what we know is having a baby is super expensive and much more so in the rest of the world. We'll talk about specific numbers, but as a teaser, in Finland, having a baby costs anywhere from $60 to $70, period. Not thousands, just $60 to $70. 
C-section is the most common major surgery performed in the United States. We performed about 1.2 in 2018. So you can imagine that that's an incredibly high healthcare cost. Hysterectomy and other gynecologic surgery in general is also very common and also expensive. For some reason, I had a really hard time seeing exactly how many hysterectomies were performed in 2018, because especially with inpatient versus outpatient. But regardless, multiple hundred thousand hysterectomies are performed, and the cost for GYN surgery in general in 2013 was $771 million. How much do deliveries cost? I was going to do a poll, but as you guys probably know, I'm not technologically advanced here, so I am hoping everyone can be engaged and everybody can enter in what they think the cost of a vaginal delivery is and the cost of a C-section into the chat box. So here, what I'm talking about, the total cost of delivery at hospital stay, meaning like, you know, if you get an epidural and if you say, you know, one day versus two days and all the things that you get on labor and delivery for a vaginal delivery versus a C-section. And then next, we'll kind of talk about what patients actually pay out of pocket. So, um, Let's see, I'm pulling up the chat. Okay, C-section, $25,000. Vaginal delivery, $20,000. Um, someone said, oh my gosh, you guys are so good. Um, again, C-section, $20,000 to $30,000. Vaginal delivery, $17,000. Total guest by Dr. Watlett, perfect. Um, and then I've seen a couple of vaginal deliveries Five thousand for the total cost C-section, 13000 So, thank you for the participation, loving it. So, for a vaginal delivery, the total at Meritor specifically is about $13,700. Um, C-section is much more expensive at about $27,000. What patients usually pay out of pocket, so thinking back to, hey, the hospital giving a bill, the insurance paying a certain amount, and then the patient paying a certain amount of that, in the US, so this isn't specifically Meritor, but it's a study that was done out of the University of Michigan um, shows that in general, vaginal deliveries cost people about $4,300 and C-sections cost people about, <laughs> cost people about $5,100. And agreed, Dr. Watlett says, no wonder home births are on the rise. So for the next one, how much do our surgeries cost? So hysterectomies, here at Meritor, I got the estimations for what people are and what insurance companies are billed. So you guys can say vaginal, laparoscopic, robotic, abdominal, uh, my gross, yeah. So after insurance, exactly. What patient, patients are actually paying is $4,000 for their vaginal delivery. And you remember in Finland, they paid 70, $70 versus 4,000 in the US. So what do you guys think is the total, hysterect <laughs> is the total cost of hysterectomy here at Meritor? And Dr. Brown says she had to pay $1,000 before her C-section even happened. And that's what happens sometimes is you get that estimation of surgery if it's something scheduled, whether it's a C-section or whether it's a you know laparoscopic history. They say, hey, we think it's going to be about this amount. This is how much you should pay. Oh, perfect. Dr. Zuga is here, and I think she probably is really good at guessing this. Um, she is the director of sustainability or the medical director over at UW Health of Sustainability. Perfect. A his a Laparoscopic hysterectomy, $12,000. I have $10,000. I have vaginal is $10,000. Laparoscopic, $15,000. Robotic, $20,000. Abdominal, $30,000. $17,000. Robotic. Oh, everyone is, you guys are participating. So you guys are pretty close. Um, in general, vaginal hysterectomies are $24,000 to $32,000. I this range here she specifically gave me because she pulled uh the person who i was talking to in billing pulled out uteruses that were less than 250 grams and over 250 grams although that didn't come out for laparoscopic hysterectomies but i can imagine this the same is true but this gives you a ballpark of someone who we operate on like dr emily buttigig was in the or yesterday and she did a laparoscopic hysterectomy and this is the total cost about of what um people are paying Robotic, I, robotic hysterectomy, I was actually kind of surprised about this because I would have thought it was much more expensive, but here at Meritor, it's actually pretty comparable to what um, people are charged for laparoscopic. Um, all right, so this is another shocking thing. <laughs> the total cost of more time by surgery. So that's something that's broken down by type of surgery. There's kind of four levels. And then based on that four levels, you're gonna pay a certain amount at the very beginning of surgery for the first 15 to 30 minutes. And then after that, you're also gonna pay 
a certain amount of money per minute, or they kind of bill it as like, for every 15 minutes, you also are paying this much. Um, so for a DNC, which is a level two thing versus a level correct me, which is a level four thing, which basically means they're kind of in these different categories and thus these charges come out different. What do you think the cost for being in the OR? So this is just OR, this is not instruments, but what do you think the cost for a DNC is for the first 15, th sorry, for the first 30 minutes? And then for a laparoscopic hysterectomy for the first 15 minutes. I specifically didn't make it 30 and 15. That's for some reason why they bill it. So what do you think, like your first 30 minutes in surgery for a DNC, the OR cost is what? What do you think? Let's... Rumor among OR staff is 100 per minute. Perfect. Thanks, staff. 600, 200. Okay. Any more takers? And again, this is what's billed to the insurance. So this isn't straight out of the patient's pop. Guessing about 60 per min for low complexity, 150 for high complexity. Perfect. Well, you guys are going to be absolutely astounded. It's $5,000 for the first 30 minutes in the OR when you're doing a DNC, and it's $9,000 for the first 15 minutes when you're in the uh, for a laparoscopic hysterectomy. For time thereafter, for a DNC, it comes down to $35 per minute. For a uh, laparoscopic hysterectomy or kind of this higher level billing, it comes down to $67 per minute. This is totally crazy. Um, the last thing here that we'll go through quickly, and then I'm going to zoom for the rest of the time, but these were shocking to me too. For people who aren't in the ovary, or in the ovary, sorry, in the OR, wow, um, this might not mean a whole ton to you, but these are things that we routinely use for hysterectomy. Think of the pink Trendelenburg tag that we put people on it helps them from not sliding off their head when we put them on their head during surgery not put them on their head but tilt the table a lot um the optiview trocar kits the l hook ligature arista so specifically i just want you guys to think what does the l ligature cost and what does arista cost what do you think so five grams of arista that we spritz in people's abdomen which arista for those who aren't in the operating room is glorified potato starch truthfully it helps with hemostasis um Perfect. Steph, $96. Oh, you see, you know all these things. Arista, 5,000. L hook, 800. 800, 1,000. Good. So, what Steph Barman is talking about specifically, and this is something that we're not going to get into, but she's bringing up a great point. She says the pink pad is $96, which is about what we spend to buy it. What patients are billed, so on the billing end of things, what it actually comes out to, is about $433. So what Meritor pays to buy it is 96. What patients are charged is 433. For trocar sets that we pick up, it's 835. For the ligature, just over a thousand. And Arista is $1,500. Wow, Dr. Barrelet. That was a great guess unless you saw that. And the applicator, what we use to put through the laparoscopic port is another almost $600. So if you just need a little extra hemostasis, that was an amazing guess, a little extra hemostasis, that's $2,000. And then there's also the recovery room fee and the time that they spend in the recovery room is another thing. So the next thing I want to focus on is the cost to the planet. Um, so operating rooms in general are incredibly expensive, as we just talked about, and are also incredibly wasteful. Healthcare facilities are the second leading contributor to waste in the U.S., Specifically, we waste about 6.6 .6 tons of waste per day, which comes out to over 2 million tons of waste a year. Operating rooms, so that was kind of healthcare facilities in general. Operating rooms and labor and delivery account for about 70% of hospital waste, and this is where we spend majority of our time. ORs in general, in terms of thinking about energy, consume about three to six times more energy per square foot than anywhere else in the rest of the hospital. You can think of all the lights that we have in the OR, everything that we're using in the OR, it is just this high energy area. Um, tons of green OR initiatives that people are working on. This is a slide that um, came from the website, which you can see in the bottoms, practicegreenhealth.org. This is looking at different things that we can do to save money and help the environment within operating rooms. Hospitals that pursue these programs, as you can see in the middle, can save on average $56,000 per operating room, per operating room, not per hospital, per year. So things like fluid management systems, things like reusable medical problems, or products, excuse me, things like reprocessing of medical devices, setting up an HVAC system, et cetera. Some of these are big upfront costs, which can be challenging and can be a hard sell for healthcare systems. 
but overall it's saving people tons of money and it's also helping the environment. So if you actually think about it that way, it's kind of a win-win truthfully. Um, in terms of we talk about a couple things here quickly and then we'll talk about what we're doing here in Madison, but OR waste reduction and segregation, we think of five kinds of waste. We have an infectious or pathologic, which is what we who work in the operating room think of like as a red bag waste. We put all that stuff in there, red bag waste gets dealt with differently than that clear bag waste or just general waste. Stuff that doesn't have um, like blood or doesn't have anything that's flaky on it or something that could be content potentially an infectious issue. Pharmaceuticals is also another huge waste. You can think in the OR where the uh, anesthesiologist says, hey, need to waste meds. What that literally means is if they use one milligram of Dilaudid and they always come out of two milligram containers, at least over here at Meritor, um, they just dump one milligram of Dilaudid in some sort of charcoal thing that then just gets rid of it, never to be used again. There's also radioactive waste, sharp waste. The thing that I want to focus on or kind of draw your attention to is red bag waste. So in general, the red bag waste makes up about 24% of healthcare waste by amount, but by cost, it's about 86% of our waste cost. So basically, even though, you know, we're not by volume, it's not that we have tons and tons and tons of red bag waste, but by cost, it's so much more expensive to get rid of and to dispose of properly. And what a study showed is that up to 90% of red bag waste does not actually meet criteria for red bag waste. So basically we are just throwing things away and we're basically throwing money away because if we put, can put it in the clear bag waste, which is a lot cheaper for our healthcare system, then we therefore save a whole ton of money. Reprocessing of single use medical devices. This is something that I didn't really know a lot about. So it was very interesting to learn about during this presentation. So when you think of something like a ligature, which um, we use a lot in laparoscopic surgery, or the myasure, which we use in hysteroscopic surgery, I kind of hand wavy, like we hand them to people at the end of, case, of cases and I didn't really know what happened to them. Um, I honestly thought that potentially they get thrown away, which really broke my heart. A lot of them actually get reprocessed. So even though it's called a single use instrument, it actually goes and gets reprocessed, gets recleaned, gets reevaluated all under FDA approval. This is like very, very tight oversight. And then that single use instrument can actually be used again. About 60% of FDA approved reprocessed devices are used for surgery. So these are things, like I said, the ligature and the uh, myasure that we see and use daily. 25% of hospitals use at least one type of process, uh, reprocess single use device, which is good because basically the other option is you're throwing it away, it's going to a landfill, and then you are buying a new one. So that's a whole bunch of information about healthcare in general and waste in general. And what I thought would be really interesting is focusing in on what are we doing close to home in Madison. So I talked to Dr. Zuga, who like I mentioned is the medical of sustainability over at UW Health. And I took a couple of these slides and ideas from her, so I really appreciate that. In 2019, each OR at UW Health, so specifically UW Hospital and AFCH, produced 67 tons of waste. That's each OR. There's 27 ORs at UW, AFCH, I'm not quite sure, but just think about that much waste from each OR. And then we have Meritor in Madison, and then we have St. Mary's in Madison, and then we have Milwaukee, and then we have hospitals in the rest of Wisconsin and in the rest of the country. So you can imagine this adds up so much. This is a picture specifically of our Dane County landfill. Um, so specifically talking about that, where does our waste go? Our waste, we dump in the Dane County landfill, which is about 15 minutes or just under 10 miles away from Meritor Hospital. In 15 years, it, uh, the studies have shown that this landfill will be full. So this landfill that's right down the way, we have to start protecting and we have to stop putting so much waste into it. The other thing that as I was looking up this slide, I thought was interesting, but actually more particularly just sad, is that you can see south of that, there's the Door Creek Wetlands Wildlife Area, which you can imagine that a landfill just north of that is not the best thing for that wetlands and wildlife area. So, Steph, Barman, here's a picture of you. Um, Meritor OR initiatives. People have done a lot of great work in the last couple of years to make our um, impact on the environment here in Wisconsin and hopefully that in the world less. So specifically, Steph Barman and a lot of people got together to form a green team in the bar and they did this whole recycling revamp. One of the big things was sorting at point of source, which is something that all of us who are in the OR can do. 
point of source basically means if you open it, you sort it. We don't we don't leave it to someone who's farther off, not within um, the operating room to end up sorting this for us. In general, we think of two recycling groups, which this is a big push. There's the all in one and the plastic. Um, so basically, when you open gloves in residence, you're opening all those different pairs of gloves. You should pull them apart. The clear part goes in one and can get recycled. The other part goes in another. So you doing that and pulling your gloves apart is a huge part of this initiative. There's also a goal to reduce the amount of blue wrap that we're using and also styrofoam. Styrofoam is known to be very bad for the environment. And that was something that came in all of our OR packs or in our OR trays. And Steph did all of this um, work with our recycling management and where these things are coming from to say, hey, we don't want the styrofoam anymore. And so they changed it to cardboard, which you might notice there's that little cardboard pad, which we reuse. It comes in our packs that we open in the operating room and then we reuse it to like catch strips or something in the OR. That used to be styrofoam and that was just an area of waste that we could easily get rid of. Specifically looking at um, Meritor Hospital recycled waste shows the tons per month of recycled waste at Meritor. In 2015, 16 and 17, we had three tons of recycled waste per month. In 2018, which is when this recycling initiative that Steph was in charge of rolled out, we increased from three tons per month Five tons per month. So clearly these things made a big impact on how much we're able to recycle at Meritor. In the first quarter of 2018 alone, Meritor Re OR recycled 2,500 cubic feet of plastic film. And in talking with Steph, I thought this was hilarious because she was like, I have no idea how much that is. Like, what does that mean to me? Called up one of her friends who's a math teacher and they did a little calculation. And what they found was that how much they saved in the first quarter of 2018 was equal to filling 157 garbage trucks. So you can imagine that that is a lot of waste that things, well, things that would be going to the landfill that now we are recycling. So thanks to their efforts. Another uh, interesting area um, is anesthesia initiatives. So that are happening over at UW and here at Meritor. Um, over at UW in 2012, it sounds like the, department was saying, hey, we are wasting a lot of things, noticing that they were opening a ton before the OR cases, and then they were never for the patient. So it's basically you open it, you use that hospital do dollars that was spent on it, and then you're truly just throwing that away and it's never actually used on the patient. Specifically, they're opening two ET tubes or endotracheal tubes, which are used for intubations for every case. The stylets they were wasting. The bear huggers, which is basically what keeps the patient warm during surgery, often two were getting open, one from the nursing side and one from the anesthesia side. And then the pulse oximeters were also expensive and thrown away. Those were things that were just plastic and wrapped around a patient's finger, whereas there's reusable ones that we can reuse. So in terms of the waste, they collected all this waste that was opened but not used on patients for a week. And what they found was weekly savings of $618. And then that meant an estimated annual savings of $32,000. So that, you know, in terms of the grand scheme of what UW Health is spending or saving, you might think, oh, you know, that's just kind of like a drop in the bucket. But if that's just anesthesia over at UW, there are so much waste within the floor, there's so much waste within the surgery side, so really just on the other side of that blue drape, um, that people could also add up and be saving money. Um, let's see. The other thing that she brought up and something that I think about is like, and really what kind of spurred me to think about this was in the operating room for when we place a Foley, we use this small little plastic syringe to put fluid in it so it stays in the bladder and that's what we use during surgery. That little syringe is super cheap, it's plastic, whatever. I, sometimes I drop it, sometimes I lose it, sometimes I throw it away. And in every case, inevitably I'm like, ah, can you please open it up another 10 cc syringe so I can take the Foley out? Which seems like not a big, but when I actually stopped and thought about it, the amount of waste, plastic waste that I was using just in that act alone, and then if everybody is doing that too, that's cost that's just lost. Because potentially what we're seeing in what patients are charged is like a surgical bundle. So small things like this, they're not getting charged $1 for every syringe you open. They're getting charged $100 or something for all these small ticket items. So if we're opening things wastefully or we're not reusing things, then we're just losing money for the hospital. Another thing um, that Meritor and UW has been doing is look at um, their inhaled anesthetics and specifically the environmental impact of those. Um, two of the big ones that are used are sevoflurane and uh, historically desflurane. 
we look at that or they've been looking at that in terms of their atmospheric lifetime. So how long these stay out in the atmosphere after we use them. So within the operating room, there's something called WAGS, which is the waste. I have to look up exactly what that stands for, but it's the thing that um, uh, basically takes all of the gas that they are giving to patients and then it takes it out of the operating room. So we room are not um, breathing in that inhaled anesthetic as well as the patient. Where that actually goes is out the roof of the hospital, truly. It doesn't change at all. It's just pumped out of the top of the hospital, out into the environment. So what we need to think about is, A, from like the health for you and me, just walking around, we are ultimately exposed to these things as it's just getting put into the air, but also the atmosphere and greenhouse gas emissions um, and global warming also is implicated in this. So in terms of sevofluorine, that stays out in the atmosphere about for about a year, does for about 14 years. Nitrous oxide, which is used in labor and delivery, stays in the atmosphere, atmosphere for 114 years. So basically, if you had a baby and you use nitrous, that nitrous is going to be there by the time still when your baby has babies and then when your baby's baby has babies. In terms of a global warming potential, we think of carbon dioxide as one and everything in comparison to that. Sevofluorine has a global warming potential of 130 in comparison to carbon dioxide, and then desflurane has a pretty significant um, global warming impact or potential at 2100. So what the initiatives were is that over at UW Health, they decreased, and what we saw over time in the last, I'd say, five years or so, is they've decreased the amount that they're spending on desflurane, and they're using sevofluorine so much more. And here at Meritor Hospital, specifically, Dr. Ranke, who's one of the Madison, uh, the Madison Anesthesia Consultant physicians, said, hey, we're not using this anymore. And they stopped buying desflurane, period. And so we don't even have that in our hospital anymore because it has such a poor environmental impact. So um, I'll just kind of keep going through. Striker sustainability projects. Um, or solutions. So this I mentioned earlier about reprocessing instruments. I talked to one of the sales representatives from Stryker about this, um, specifically who works in Wisconsin. So he could talk to me about, you know, what this looks like for us. So again, what we don't want to do is throw away all of these instruments that are just single use instruments. Instead, we want to reprocess them. So then they kind of become multi use instruments. They have this program that one reprocesses things and two if they can't reprocess things then they just recycle them so instead of going into a landfill they take these things and then properly dispose of them within OBGYN, i mentioned the things that we can already use um, or that we do use and that we can um, uh, get reprocessed and then use again i'm pulling up the exact numbers here um, but specifically um, for UW, in 2019, from buying reprocessed instruments, we saved $424,000 and we saved 35,000 tons of waste. So basically what we were doing is we were saying, hey, we'll, re we'll use that reprocessed instrument as opposed to saying, no, we're not going to take that. We're just going to throw that one away or recycle that one and we're going to get a brand new one. Um, Stryker also has this sustainability pledge. And so basically in reprocessing things, they're using bio-based plastic rather than petroleum-based plastic. The bio-based plastic comes from trees and for every two trees that they cut down to make this plastic, um, they are replanting three more trees. They're also reduced packaging and have done so by about 34% and then using water efficient systems. So when they are reprocessing these instruments, they found ways to decrease their water use with each reprocessing cycle. Um, this specifically is UW data. So what I mentioned is in 2019, Health saved over $400,000 from using reprocessed instruments, but we don't use only reprocessed instruments. There, for whatever reason, or phys physicians' preference and whatnot, we sometimes use new instruments. But if we were to use solely reprocessed instruments, we save ourselves hundreds of thousands of dollars. So this specifically, you can see ligatures, which are those um, devices that we use during surgery daily. Um, if we use just reprocessing, reprocess ligatures, we'd save ourselves over $600,000. Um, so this, I just kind of want to take, like everyone take a step back because I think when it comes to, um, the environmental impact and cost of the healthcare system, like I mentioned before, it is so daunting. But I just gave you three examples of things that were at Meritor Hospital, at UW Hospital, um, and with reprocessing instruments that people have said, hey, this is an issue, and this is an issue that I want to fix. And so if they can do it, 
truly, so can we. So I really want to spur everyone to think of things in a more um, cost-effective and environmentally friendly way. Specifically, just, just as I'm running out of time, I just wanted to mention ideas to decrease our cost within the OR and the, our waste within the OR. Items that will ultimately decrease patient and insurance bills, thinking about mode of energy and how much hemostasis we're getting, surgical technique, the use of Arista, obviously, like I talked about, that's $2,000 for a little bit of additional hemostasis. Don't get me wrong, hemostasis is incredibly important, but is there, I think, being more cognizant of price and do we really need it or is there something else that we can do to maintain this hemostasis or make us feel comfortable not using this Arista? Granted, I will still use it in but I think being aware of the cost that it has for insurance companies and patients um, is really important. Items that will also decrease hospital costs. Like I'm saying, we are just opening things, not using them, and that's just throwing money down the drain. 10 cc syringes, sutures that we open and don't use, gloves that we open and don't use, gowns that we open and don't use. So really being aware of like, okay, how many times do I need to change gloves during this case? How many times do I need to change gowns? I'm gonna open just that many, or maybe if I think it might need to be another one, I'll set that on the side for the nurse to open, but I'm not just gonna keep opening things for the sake of opening them because that's just very wasteful. Um, in terms of different procedures, which I'll just buzz through, obviously there's all these new things and all these new techniques that we can use. The ligature device for a self-injectomy, which a self-injectomy is removing somebody's fallopian tubes. The classic way is stamping and tying. We're using instruments that are metal that can get autoclaved and reused over and over again. The ligature, yes, can get reprocessed, but even the cost of reprocessing is significant and the cost of the ligature itself is much more than the cost of buying one clamp that we can reuse over and over and over again. Laparoscopic fascial closure is another thing that I got on to, got very interested in while I was on GYN. We have three different devices here at Meritor that we can use for laparoscopic closure. So if we have port sites that are above a centimeter, we close them in order to prevent herniation um, of bowel. And there's different ways to do this. I had never even heard of this port closure needle, but this is something also that can get autoclaved. The hospital bought it once, we can now reuse, reuse, reuse. Endoclosed devices, um, you guys are also familiar with, and then the Carter Thomason. How these are going from left to right is from increasing price. So the port closure needle is a higher upfront cost and a very, very low daily use cost due to autoclaving. The endoclosed device in terms of what it costs the hospital, not so much what we charge patients, is about $19, and the Carter Thomason is about $190. So think about, you know, oh, hey, I can use this other thing, which might take me one more minute to use because I'm a little more fumbly with it, but that is ultimately going to save me money. Uter manipulators, same thing. There's a cost differential there, which I won't get into, but just know that it's there. And also roomy manipulators are reusable. So it's something, the tips are not, but the instrument itself is. So thinking like, okay, what's my environmental impact from this uh, uterine manipulator that I'm just ultimately gonna throw away? And then hysteroscopy, we kind of touched on already with the Myosher and how we can reprocess that. And then hysteroscopic way to remove polyps, which was just polyp forceps. Obviously there's a big cost differential in this. And what studies show is that the new way in which we're visualizing and actually taking them out is more effective. But it's just something that I was in the OR with Dr. Bills like a month ago or something, and there's this big polyp, and he said, well, why don't you remove it with polyp for such? And I was like, what? Um, and ultimately I did, and it was kind of fun. And then we did look with the hysteroscope, but it was something that, you know, it made, wow, that probably was a lot cheaper. Granted, outcome would be hard to say if it would be as successful in terms of symptoms, but regardless. Um, so kind of one of the takeaways is how do we reconcile financial costs with everything, with environmental costs, with educational costs? I don't think there's necessarily that, but I think that's a really complex question um, that we who especially work in academic medicine, um, the educational costs and teaching residents and teaching medical students is something that we have to factor into all of this. Um, and then the last couple of things which I touch on as now that I'm, you know, giving a speech to the department and everyone's listening, um, post-op day ones for lab, post-op day one C-section labs is something that I kind of think that we don't necessarily need to be doing. I looked into studies that show, um, I looked into the studies that showed what that costs and what kind of, what the data is between, behind us getting, um, CBCs on everybody on post-op day one, and the data isn't really great, honestly. Yes, there are indeed risk factors that increase risk of 
needing a transfusion or having a postoperative bleed or whatnot. But in general, for women who are low risk, especially with planned C-sections and who have no significant risk factors and who are more importantly asymptomatic, us getting a CBC is actually not necessarily helpful at all. And it's also very expensive for us. So in general at Meritor, we had 100, 1,100 um, C-sections in 2017. The cost of a CBC, which this floored me, but this is now not necessarily the cost of me ordering it, but what a patient and the insurance company sees is $110, which totally was floor, uh, floored me. So what we actually spend on getting CBCs for post-op day one C-sections at, at Meritor is $131,000 a year. I'm not saying we shouldn't get them on anybody, but I think we can think more critically about like who really needs this. Um, and that's another way that we could save costs for something that isn't necessarily that helpful in some situations. So in general, I want you guys to all come away from this talk and think of one thing that you can change on your day-to-day -day basis, whether it's in clinic, whether it's in the operating room that can help decrease financial and surgical waste. I talked about CBCs and I think we should think more critically about that if that's something that we need because that is a big cost savings if for something that isn't necessarily always useful and low risk. And then I just want you to kind of go throughout your day-to-day -day life thinking of your personal impact on our patients and our planet and making with these in mind. I um, am happy to take any questions. Ramsey? Yeah. This is Bhagwat. Hashtag mind blown. <laughs> Thank you for edu educating me so well. I mean, this is amazing lecture. I cannot uh, thank you enough. And for the amount of uh, time, effort you put into researching this and getting the local details, uh, just absolutely mind blown. Thank you. Um, following from the m m presentation. I just want to make a plug, and you would love this, for the bipolar resectoscope. I have been really, really uh, disappointed that almost nobody knows how to use the resectoscope here. Mm -hmm. So much so that the operator staff don't even, uh, you know, quite a few times I've had circulators who don't know how to assemble the resectoscope because they are rusty, and I don't blame them. We don't engage them enough that they haven't done it in often enough to uh, uh, to assemble them. Just the cost differential you were talking about, $25 for that bipolar uh, loop versus $900 for the MyAssure. I'm not saying MyAssure has no place in this, but MyAssure definitely should be used very infrequently. The second thing is the environmental cost you talked about, that little loop, and you know it's a metal; it can be recycled. As opposed to the whole myasure, it 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 does fill the landfill as well. You know, I don't know how well it is actually taken apart and uh, and recycled. So mm -hmm. thank you again. Yeah. Uh, Ramsey, I see. It. Oh, go ahead. Oh, Ramsey, uh, Ellen Hertenbach, uh, thank you so much for this. It's just fabulous, um, and I I love the idea of green medicine. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what that means, but um, I also wanted to say that um, I wasn't aware of that so much was getting pushed on to patients in terms of cost. I've had the same insurance uh, for 25 years and um, in the same town, I worked in the same place. And um, this is a 21st century problem, this, this cost going on to patients. Um, I had several surgeries uh, in the 1990s. Uh, and, and I had uh, two obstetrical events, lovely uh, vaginal delivery and C-section, and mm -hmm. I didn't even see a bill, like a zero bill. The, I, I saw no bill. And um, and again, same insurance, same everything. And now, you know, you and I and everybody in the department will have to pay a bill just to go to a visit. Um, and I didn't realize how much of this uh, cost for these larger procedures is really getting pushed on to patients. Um, so... Um, cost is a really tricky thing. I just think you did a great job of uh, presenting um, this information. Thanks. Hey, this is Jesse. I'm so pumped that you talked about this. something that I like really frustrated me as an intern because we do so many vaginal deliveries is all of the stuff that's on the delivery trays. 
um, our de delivery tables, like all of those laps and all the towels that we don't use and that we throw away. Um, and you know, like the, the needle, there's like a little brick for, um, for sharps to go. And that's super important and great for safety. But if we don't do a repair, we don't need that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if we can find a way to like have more things stored in the drawers so that the nurses can get them out because they get us sutures out. They get us the lidocaine out. Mm -hmm. I think we could have more things that aren't being opened every single time and then thrown away mm -hmm. needlessly if they're not getting used. And that's something that I would love to see us work on. If we have any interns on the call, you can do a project about this. That also is your resident research project. Ramsey, I was wondering, it's Maya. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about differentiating the red bag waste and how we, when we're putting stuff away, can decide what goes where. Staff Barman, are you still on? Please say yes. Yep. Yes, I'm here. Can you talk about that? Yes. Yeah. So there's federal law that requires us to utilize red bag waste correctly. We must put in it what we must put in it and we must leave out what we must leave out and specifically if something is drippable pourable flakeable with biohazardous waste on it or one equivalent is 100 milliliters of fluid um those those are the things we're thinking about at the end of the case when everybody's tearing the drapes off and trying to pour it in the right container now there's definitely gray area there are people who think that the vaginal prep sponge um you know basically that entire prep tray that we prep the patient with needs to go in the red bag waste well not all of it does maybe the insertion sponge on like a dnc that's bleeding however your normal vaginal prep for 99 percent of our cases that can go in the regular waste so it's something that we work on and it's a challenge for us as well as or staff because there's a lot of gray area. It's very subjective. Different people have different comfort levels with what they want to throw in each bag, but it, it's dictated by federal law. So um, it's tricky, but it's just important to think about drippable, pourable, flakeable, biohazardous fluid. So like a, a surgical drape that has some blood on it, that's not a lot, does not need to go in there. Um, I would say, like, for example, I was in a um, postpartum tubal ligation yesterday, and, like, there might have been a tiny bit of blood somewhere on the drape, but, at, you know, these are things that the nurse and the tech are kind of already cognizant of. We're looking at it. The circulating nurse is pushing the garbages up to the field for you at the end so that you're not carrying a dripping drape all across the room because we're the ones mopping that up later. And by the way, you probably will step in it and then traipse it down the hallway. So um, we are pretty actively thinking about these things, even though it doesn't really seem like it. And we might just tuck the red bag in the corner so you can't actually get to it. Um, we might push it up to the field so that you don't drip it across the room. So um, it's not necessarily on the team at the field to determine that. The thing that I would challenge you all with that's going to help us more as circulators at the end of the case and surgical techs and cost and waste is making sure before you pull out those drapes, there's nothing non-disposable in them. Um, we lose a lot of cost there by something getting inadvertently left in the underbuttocks drape and then put into the waste. Thanks, staff. So, so I know that's like clear as mud and doesn't exactly tell you the answer and nobody's going to like arrest you because you did the wrong thing. But just like, Put that thinking cap on and just think, well, is this going to drip off or flake off and harm someone down the road? Think about the think about the garbage delivery people. Think about the people at the waste management plant, at the pelletary plant, and just kind of be respectful of the next person down the line in the in the waste stream. And if you have questions, and Maya, that's great. I mean, I agree. I'm still like, uh, I don't really know if this is too much blood or not. Ask because that's a lot of times I just grab all the drapes and I just pop them in the red bag, which. I probably shouldn't be doing. Uh, questions or comments from anybody? Well, thank you so much. If you have yeah. questions about anything, I'm happy to answer. Um, any further questions, you can just email me. Um, and then 
also, oh, this would be very interesting. So Dr. Zuga, who left the meeting now, talked about the life cycle analysis of a hysterectomy, um, which I'll look at that article, but she dropped the article in the um, chat if anybody wants to look into it. So thank you so much for everyone who listened. Um, and let me know if you have any questions at any point. Wonderful job, Ramsey. Thank you so much. You're welcome.